All right, um, we're going to go ahead and get started now. Sorry, we just a uh, couple technical difficulties, but we're ready to go. Um, we're going to keep this short and sweet today, so uh, 20, 25 minutes, and then some questions and answers afterwards. So um, thank you for joining us. This is the fourth presentation of our surrounding DAS. So today uh, we're going to be discussing system design and talk about the tools necessary to develop a complete solution. Um, as I mentioned, this will be about 25 minutes and uh, we want to encourage you to ask questions. Uh, your lines have been muted, but there should be a comment section on the, on the left side of your screen. Uh, feel free at any time to, to ask questions and we'll get them written down. And um, if we don't address it during this call, um, we will certainly make sure that we get you the information and answers that you need afterwards. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this today because uh, hopefully any of you that have joined us uh, previously have seen these slides and they look familiar. Um, but I just wanted to provide you again with a corporate overview of both ComScope and this next slide, which is Vision Technologies. Um, so the next two slides should also look familiar to you. These are our, pre our presenters for this webinar series. Um, Ron Plekis unfortunately could not join us today, so I want to welcome Rick Baldessari with Vision Technologies. Um, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him, and we will get started. Thank you, Virginia, and thank you, everybody, for uh, attending the webinar this morning. What we're going to be focusing on today, as Virginia said, is designing a DAS solution. Uh, some of the tools creating the RF design, going to talk about some uh, common mistakes and uh, show some uh, visual examples of those mistakes and uh, talk about predictive analysis, which gives us um, uh, expectations to be expected from the design. So just to recap, you know, uh, this is a series. The first uh, in the series was a DAS overview presentation. Uh, the second uh, talk was to discuss how to find a competent DAS uh, integrator, someone who knows what they're doing and how they can help you get a system uh, up and running. The last session was talking about uh, data analysis and collection and doing an RF survey, so understanding the, the environment. And this session is now going to talk about uh, once we've collected the data, and we understand what's going on to get into the actual design of the system. All our previous series are on uh, Vision uh, Tech videos on YouTube, and you see the links there as well. So if you went to YouTube and searched on Vision Tech videos, you would see these three previous sessions. Okay, so now uh, this presentation, we're going to talk about uh, the design process. And uh, as everything, you know, to create a system has to have a good foundation. To have a good foundation, you have to understand, you know, where you're coming from and where you want to go. So you want to understand the customer requirements. We need to have an understanding of how many users are going to be in the building, uh, both the current and future needs of the DAS and also uh, customer budget and budgeting process. In addition to that, we need to, you know, kind of review the facility, make sure we know uh, and understand both uh, the location, whether it's an urban or rural type of environment, whether we're talking about uh, a small building, a large building, uh, kind of the, the floor plan layout, right? If it's going to be kind of like a, a college dormitory, going to be uh, hospitality, guest rooms. Those types of buildings are typically long, narrow buildings. On the other side of the spectrum, you'll have like office buildings in, say, the Washington, D.C. area, where the in, in building can take up an entire block. So under, and then you have everything in between. So you have to understand kind of the layout, which uh, gives you an idea of where to start placing some equipment. Some of the uh, OEM options, they have you know, low power equipment, high power equipment, what type of cabling should be best used, you know, coaxial cable, cable 
uh, fiber optic, uh, twisted pair cabling, whether it's, uh, you know, CAT6, CAT6A, uh, shielded, unshielded. So you've got to rattle all these things around in your head to, you know, kind of start the design process. So the, the industry standard design software tool uh, is created by IBWave, and uh, it is the tool that uh, many of the carriers, if not all the carriers, actually require to be used. So when you create your design and submit it to, submit it to the wireless service providers for their technical review, they want to see the design in IBWave. Um, not only that, they want to see uh, uh, predictive analysis as well. And so IBWave has several, three different uh, certification levels, where the first level is actually the design tool that allows you to import floor plans, allows you to uh, create signal sources, whether they're base stations or repeaters. And then you can add both the DAS equipment uh, splitters, coax cables, antennas, and you've got to start interconnecting all of these uh, components together to create your design. The uh, certification level two gets, you know, the next stage of the process, which is actually propagation, RF propagation um, and optimization. So you can take the data that you collected in your RF survey and import it into IBWave and compare it to your predictive analysis. Uh, in order to do a predictive analysis, you need to create or uh, uh, identify walls within the floor plans. And you also have different propagation characteristics that you can modify and adjust within IBWave so IBWave can uh, uh, better mimic the data collection that was done during the survey process. So you can, uh, during the survey process, you, you do propagation uh, collection, and then you can import that into IBWave and you can validate that your floor plans and your predictive analysis, analysis within IBWave matches the survey data that you've collected. And then the third certification level for IBWave gets into uh, complex uh, venues such as stadiums, convention centers, deals with uh, MIMO, uh, Wi-Fi offloading, and uh, you know, data throughput considerations for such uh, large capacity venues. Another less sophisticated tool, but one that's been around uh, a very long time, is a link budget uh, analysis tool which is basically a spreadsheet tool that allows you to add and subtract all the, the RF gains and losses within a system. Utilizing a uh, link budget analysis tool gives you the ability to do a preliminary Dixie Cup approach, which basically means uh, based on my link budget, I expect my antenna to propagate uh, 50 feet away from the antenna, 70 feet away from the antenna, uh, somewhere in between. And then I take, you know, and draw round circles on my floor plans where I think I need to put the antennas to make sure I provide total floor coverage. So a link budget and Dixie cup kind of used together to give you a preliminary approach. And you can use that preliminary approach to then start placing your antennas within IBWave. So within IBWave, we'll, we'll now focus the next couple of slides using IBWave, and doing the initial setup is very critical. So you have to input the floor plans, and then you have to properly scale those floor plans. In a multi-story building, you need to set up reference points so all your vertical locations are in the same uh, space on all the floor plans. So in essence, you need to make sure that your elevators rise vertically all the way up for all the floors. 
Also, too, part of the initial setup is identifying the number of wireless service providers. And so therefore, that determines the number of uh, RF signal sources. We need to uh, know how many uh, wireless service providers are going to be shared. So whether it's going to be a neutral host solution supporting two wireless service providers, or more commonly, it's supporting all four wireless service providers. And while we have uh, the number of service providers, we also need to worry about the number of channels that are being uh, supported by each of the different wireless service providers. And, and uh, we'll show that a little bit later in the presentation. And then we need to understand our design criteria, whether we're doing RSSI or now it's actually more commonly RSRP and RSCP is what the carriers are requiring more than an RSSI type of uh, measurement and coverage. And the coverage is going to end up being dependent upon the type of walls and the composition and placement of the walls, the elevators uh, in, on the floor. And uh, typical requirements are 95% coverage. Uh, sometimes it's uh, 80 or 80, or uh, I should say 85 or 90% coverage. Uh, in some cases, like public safety, you, where there is 99% coverage in critical areas. So understanding how much of the floor or where the floor has to be covered is quite important as well. So when you create the design in IBWAVE, uh, you know, it's very easy just to start putting uh, the items on paper, but it's actually very important to do it in a very neat and orderly uh, manner because the design document will ultimately become the installation instruction manual. And so the design document it shows where all the antennas are placed, and shows where all the equipment is placed in the uh, telecommunication rooms or equipment closets. And you have all the interconnections that take place between the equipment and the antennas. It includes uh, splitters and other passive devices. We need to understand cable pathways. And so creating a very neat design is important so the installers know how to uh, install the system, and then actually the installation manual tied in with the uh, changes that are made during the construction, you know, becomes an as-built document. And then the as-built document is important for the uh, maintaining the system through the life of the system. IBWAVE also has the ability to generate a bill of materials can auto-calculate uh, cable distances uh, so you can automatically account for waste. And it can give you this bill of materials based on, you know, system building, you know, per floor. So if you need to provide granular level uh, bill of materials, you can, you can easily do that. So you know kind of uh, your, your material costs at various different phases of the project. IBWAVE also has a database of parts, and this database of parts allows you to do some what-if scenarios. So what if I use this antenna over that antenna? What if I use this powered remote over that powered remote? And we have the ability to do you know, some what-if testing as well. So incorporating the site survey data, uh, we need to understand what some of the walls are that we're going to place onto our floor plans. We need to be concerned whether they're concrete block walls, whether it's a dry wall, or whether it's a cubicle type of environment. Uh, you know, cubicles are typically going to be, you know, anywhere from uh, four feet to six feet partitions where, you know, office walls are, are sealing the floor and usually, you know, in the, the 9 to, you know, 10, 11 feet uh, height. Uh, the, again, the uh, survey should have verified some of the cable pathways. Where is their vertical pathway uh, so we can get between floors within a building? 
and what are some of the horizontal restrictions. Staying away from uh, some secure locations within the building, firewalls that have to be penetrated. Some buildings have cable trays throughout the horizontal floor, and you know we need to, to follow that pathway. So understanding cable pathways and then how they relate to the uh, DAS requirements for coax or fiber or, or copper installations, you know, all has to be kind of coordinated and thought about during the design process. Also, where are the critical areas within the uh, facility that needs to be covered? So while I mentioned earlier that we may only need to provide 95% coverage within the facility, if the CEO's office is within the 5%, then that design isn't going to work. So we need to understand critical areas and make sure those critical areas are covered as well. So now we have the basic design we're putting together in the IB Wave and we need to also import the survey results and overlay that onto uh, the floor plans with our design. So now we have the ability to do a predictive analysis and compare it to the survey analysis so we can validate that we have this, uh, DAS dominance. So the DAS uh, users in the building will stay on the in-building system and not utilize the outdoor cell towers. It also gives us the ability to um, uh, validate some of our uh, soft handoff areas. And as I mentioned, we can change antennas, we can change equipment, and we can run our various what-if scenarios. And then when we get all of um, uh, the, the predictive survey kind of fine-tuned, we can generate heat maps. Um, to provide that to both the uh, wireless service providers for their analysis as well as providing it to the uh, customer so they can see how the DAS is going to perform once it's installed. So now there, there's you know, several common mistakes that uh, are made by uh, designers that are either um, uh, careless or not paying attention to, um, you know, the, the initial setup. And, you know, so if they don't scale the floor plan correctly, you're going to get inaccurate cable lengths. And so now if you think the building is 200 feet long and it is actually 250 or 275 feet long, you're not going to have enough cable because your cable distances will be off and that's going to create problems when it comes time to the installation. The installers are going to run out of cable, the project is going to be over budget, and you know it's not going to work out very well. Uh, on the same token, if you think the building is 300 feet long and it is only 200 feet long, then you've actually uh, overcharged the customer and you might not even win the bid to begin with because somebody else did a more accurate design or more accurate scaling. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we have uh, building references to help us make sure our vertical pathways are, are accurate, and especially with uh, 3D predictive analysis, if our reference points are off, our, our 3D analysis will be uh, completely off as well. Um, incorrect wall types and incorrect wall compositions are, are very common mistakes as well, and we'll see that here in just a, a moment. So here we've got an, an RF design, and going through the legend on the right, we see that this is RSCP values. And we see at the top of the rainbow scale, the pink and the red are very strong signals, and the, the light blue and the dark blue are weaker signals. If we look at the overall coverage, we see that we've got uh, a lot of, of um, pink, reds, orange, and yellows. And by looking at the legend, we see that 95.4% of that floor plan is at a neg 75 
signal strength or stronger, which indicates you know, a, a, a great signal coverage and actually indicates possibly a little bit of an overdesign because uh, having a signal that is, is too strong does not always equate to better performance. You, you get a, a, a stage of, of um, diminishing returns. So just because I've got a, a system that's neg 75 does not mean that it is going to perform better than coverage that is at a neg 85 or better. It just means I spent more money to provide a neg 75 coverage. However, if we take a little bit closer look at this design, uh, specifically at locations L1, L2, and L3 is indicated by the arrows, I'll focus in at the L3 location because it's the most obvious and easiest to see. We've got the big gray arrows that indicate the RF direction. And we see by location L3, the gray arrow is pointing into a room that is completely yellow. If we continue on in the direction of the arrow, we cross a wall and we see the signal strength drop from yellow to green, and the green indicates a weaker signal, which makes sense when we're going through a wall. But now we see halfway through the room, the signal gets stronger and turns back to yellow. We go into, then we cross another wall where the signal gets weaker, turns green. Halfway through the room, the signal becomes stronger and turns yellow. There is no reason for the signal to magically become stronger halfway through the room. And so it indicates that there's a problem with the, uh, with, with the design. And that problem actually is that the walls were drawn as five foot partitions and not floor to ceiling walls like they should have been. And since it's only a five-foot wall, what we're seeing is RF shadowing take place, where right by the wall, the signal is weaker. But as you get away from the wall, the, the effects of the wall are no longer seen. So the signal goes back to being stronger. So because the walls were drawn as five-foot walls versus floor-to-ceiling walls, we see this design pattern. Before we go off this slide, one other thing I want to point to is there was no scaling for this floor plan. And so the designer went to a doorway, measured a doorway, said that doorway is three feet, and therefore the resultant length is 361 feet long and 183 feet wide. So now if we go to the next slide, the only adjustment that was done to this slide is we've changed the walls from being five foot partitions to being uh, nine foot floor to ceiling walls. And just with that single change, you'll see that our design prediction has changed dramatically. And now looking back at our scale, we see that it isn't until uh, we get down into the neg 95 range that we get close to the 97.2% the building coverage or floor coverage. So our coverage for the floor has dramatically changed from neg 75 down to a neg 95 for 95% 95 coverage. Now, if we were to overlay our RF survey data onto this and the cell tower supporting uh, part of this building is on the right-hand side, it is very possible that our design would not work because we might not have dash dominance on the right-hand side of this floor. So while the uh, mistaken partitions, the design looked very good, now the design could actually not work based upon where the cell tower is in relationship to the floors. So this next 
slide talks about our scaling in more so. And so here, this is the second floor of the building. We were looking at the third floor of the building. Now the second floor, we've, the designer went to a doorway, measured the doorway at the S1 position, showing that the doorway was measured, and set up a three-foot door. Now the resultant length of the floor is 422 feet versus the 361 that we saw for the third floor. You know, that's a, that's a, a fair amount of, of error to have between floors. We see here that the length is 209 feet versus the 183. So by going to a doorway and then not double checking the overall length of the floor plan, we see we've got inconsistent floor sizing, which will create problems for a bill of material and our predictive analysis and our vertical reference points will all be off. So we talked a little bit about the link budget as another tool, and that's providing us preliminary information. So I wanted to, to put up a, a link budget and, and take a look at, at how a link budget can be used to help us uh, design an overall system. So the link budget is showing us uh, a link budget for two wireless service providers, you know, one and two. We have the composite output power of the uh, IONU ComScope remote, and for the lower bands at 750 and 880, it has a 29 dBm composite output power. Now that composite output power is shared between two wireless service providers at 750 megahertz but is actually shared for three wireless service providers at the 800 megahertz or 880 megahertz range because Sprint may, uh, is planned for future growth. And since Sprint is planned for future growth, we need to factor in their power consumption so we can properly account for when they come onto the system, they do not negatively impact the other two carriers. The same holds true with the PCS band at 1960. We're assuming T-Mobile and Sprint will be added at a later time. So up front, we have to account for the power load and power sharing that will be taking place in the PCS band. And the 2130, the AWS band, the same thing. Uh, T-Mobile will be added there at a later time, so we have to divide that power three ways and not just two ways, as shown on the link budget. And so we come up with the composite power per wireless service providers. Then each service provider brings in a number of different channels to deal with capacity. And then we end up with a resultant power per channel, and that's our initial power that's going to be provided to all to each of the individual channels per wireless service provider. And then the other various uh, rows and columns deal with uh, system gains and losses due to cabling, antennas, and free path loss, and body loss, and wall clutters. And then we, we end up with our RSSI values, our pilot and control uh, values that are critical, and then we result with our RSCP and RSRPs that are now being looked at by the carriers and meets certain requirements. So in summary, uh, you know, preparation is key to making sure we provide the correct design for the customer. We need to make sure that we understand future growth, we understand equipment capabilities, we understand the layout of the venue. You know, the IBWave software is good, but with any software program, if you don't give it the right data input, it's not going to give you valid data output. So the old garbage in, garbage out uh, applies to IBWave as any other type of software program. So we need to make sure you pay attention to the details because the devil is in the details 
And if the details aren't right, your system is not going to be right. Your design is not going to be right. And you can fine tune your design uh, using the predictive analysis tool. So you can do that what if scenarios, moving an antenna, you know, a couple of feet this way or that way uh, to make sure that the design will ultimately work when it gets installed. And remember that your design documentation becomes the installation manual. And then that installation manual becomes the as-built document so that system can be maintained throughout the life cycle. So with that, uh, thank you for uh, listening to our design uh, session. And I'll turn it over to Virginia for uh, questions and uh, follow-up. Uh, thanks, Rick, for the information. Um, this is very helpful uh, as we continue our series. So um, just a couple questions came through. The conference has been muted. The conference has been muted. The conference has been unmuted. Um, sorry about that. Um, I, I believe you've been unmuted at this point. Um, so just, just to let you guys know um, if there's any background noise. But anyway, um, moving forward, um, the first question that we received, Rick, uh, was about your predictive analysis. I think you touched on it already, but maybe you can expand on this. Uh, why wouldn't you want a stronger signal? So if, if you have a stronger signal within the building, um, it, it only gives you a benefit to a certain point. And then a stronger signal does not uh, equate into better performance. So by having an exceptionally strong signal, the only thing that you're really doing there is costing more money for more equipment, more materials for the DAS, but it is not going to improve uh, phone quality or data throughput. So uh, an overly strong signal is just essentially wasted uh, money and resources. Okay, another question that came through uh, has to do with your link budget. Who determines the acceptable RSCP, RSRP standards? So the acceptable standards are really set by the wireless service providers. Uh, wireless service providers will look at, uh, you know, have certain requirements to make sure that uh, the services are robust and that their services will work properly within the building. Uh, and since this is licensed frequency and we need their permission to retransmit their signals within the building, they have to approve the technical design and solution. If the technical design and solution does not meet their requirements, then they won't provide you with the authorization to retransmit their signals and therefore you've installed a system that you cannot utilize. Many times, you know, if you look at your phone and your phone doesn't work properly or you're having troubles with, with, with your phone, you don't look at your phone and say, gee, that person who designed and installed the dash really did a bad job. You look and say, gee, my wireless carrier is not doing a good job. So they would prefer not to be in that building than to be in a situation where there's poor, poor coverage due to a poor system design and installation. Another question that just came in, um, can you please expand on the reference point you spoke about during initial setup in the design process? Okay, so the reference point is used to provide vertical uh, continuity within the building. So you want to make sure that you know, all the elevator shafts are, are in line. All the vertical cable pathways are in line. So when you're going from the first floor to the second floor to the third floor, you know that it's, it's 15 feet uh, to do that vertical distance. If your reference points are not correct, the software might think that it's, it's 20 feet between the first floor and the second floor and 32 feet between the second floor and the third floor because your reference points are not set up properly and so therefore the buildings are not vertically aligned. No. 
Okay, um, we're just out of time now, so uh, yeah. we're going to go ahead and wrap things up. We do have a couple more questions that we will address offline. So uh, again, we want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, yeah. Please note that our next presentation will actually be in September. We're going to take a little bit of a break in August. Um, so our next presentation is OEM product considerations on September 22nd. Uh, we've also listed previous session information on this last slide. And um, there's contact information for both Rick and Ron if you have any further questions. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up. We want to thank you for joining us, and we'll see you in September. Access, sir. Thank you.